Hello everyone, in this video we are going to talk about material treatment. So the material properties not only depend on the composition of the material, but also the treatment that the material has experienced. So the history of the material is very important. When we had in-person classes, I used to bring two aluminum rods with different heat treatment, and one of them was very easy to bend, the other one was almost impossible to bend. So same alloy, same composition, but just because of the treatment, the material property can be vastly different. The two treatment that we are going to talk in this lab is cold working or strain hardening, which basically we are introducing a strain into the material, but below the annealing temperature. If we introduce the strains into the material higher than the annealing temperature, at that temperature, as we are adding residual stresses, the residual stresses are removed because of the high temperature. So that our grain boundaries won't stay deformed and they would be, they would reshape. So the strain hardening for this lab, we are applying tensile loading to our dog bone specimens and then we are looking at a stress strain curve. So in a stress strain curve, after the elastic region, then the early portion is the strain hardening portion where our material is getting actually harder or the strength is increased and then this region is the necking region. So when we are adding strains, we are adding strains in this region. So we are applying load and then we unload the specimen after unloading, we get rid of the elastic displacement, but we are going to have some plastic deformation or permanent deformation. After reloading, then the material property would be different. We are going to have a different yield and different ultimate. Here, we are going to perform a strain hardening on two materials, aluminum and hot rolled steel. We are not going to apply a strain hardening to cold roll steels because cold roll steels have already been strain hardened during manufacturing. We have already introduced the strains. We are going to apply 2%, 4%, and 6% for aluminum and for hard roll steel, 6%, 9%, and 12% strains. But our tensile machine does not understand strains. Our tensile machine understands displacement. We know the equation for a strain is displacement over the original length. So if we have the, our desired strain level, the displacement would be simply our strains times the original length. But what length are we talking about? After we place our specimen into the tensile machine, into the grips, whatever length is outside the grip would be our original length or we call this grip lens. And the strain hardening is being applied to all this lens. This should not be confused with the gauge lens that we previously talked. We use gauge lens, I'm gonna show it with a small L for determining the elongation of our material or area reduction. So our gauge lens is usually two inch, our grip lens could be different depending on how you place the specimens but let's say it's four inch and if you're gonna apply let's say five percent of strain you will have 0.2 inch displacement so we, up, we place the specimen into our tensile machine then we apply tensile loading until we see 0.2 inch and then we release the specimen we remove the specimen so our specimen is now a strain hardened and then we place it again and we apply tensile loading until failure because we have multiple stage therefore we have three measurement first the initial measurement the initial the gauge length the gauge width and thickness then after a strain hardening so here is the strain hardening. We are gonna remove our specimen from the tensile machine and then take intermediate measurement. After we take the intermediate measurement, then we place 
our specimen into tensile machine until failure. And then we are recording the stress strain curve using the software only for this region from the intermediate to final failure. Uh, if you look at the stress strain curve, we are expecting to see such a trend. So this is just expectation. In reality, a lot of things can go wrong and we might not exactly see uh, this trend. But as we are introducing strains, our, as we are moving from 2% to 4% and 4% to 6%, we are expecting our yield strengths to increase. We are expecting our ultimate to increase as well. But the elongation or a strain to failure is expected to decrease. So in terms of macroscopic behavior, we are going to see higher yield strengths in a strain hardening, higher ultimate strengths, but a lower ductility. So we always have a trade-off between different treatment. So you can think of the first two as the advantage and then the last one as disadvantage. And we measure ductility by looking at the elongation. But it's also important to see what's happening inside the material at macroscopic level that is causing such macroscopic properties. The microscopic causes could be the dislocation motion is changing, our dislocation density is increasing, and our grain boundaries are deformed. So what distinguishes engineers from technician is the understanding of microscopic properties and try to link microscopic causes to macroscopic properties. Because otherwise, we are just doing trial and error if we don't understand what's happening inside the material that is causing those changes. The other process that we are going to look into is the annealing. So there are three conditions for the annealing. We have to heat up the material just below the fried austenite temperature. We need to allow it to equilibrate for 60 minutes. So we need to put it into the furnace for 60 minutes. We are going to have a furnace. We are going to heat up our furnace for this lab to 1200 Fahrenheit. We place our dog bone specimen here. And then we are going to keep it for, you have to keep it for uh, 60 minutes or one hour. So all the residual stresses will be released. And then we are going to cool it back into the air, into ambient temperature. So remember for cooling in heat treatment, we have different types of cooling. We can quench it in water, in oil. But here for annealing, it's very important to cool it in room temperature. Uh, the material that we are going to use is cold roller steel because it's already been strain hardened. Now we can do annealing so we can remove all the strain hardening effect. We are going to heat it up to 1200 Fahrenheit and then we are going to cool it. Uh, we are going to keep it at 1200 Fahrenheit for different time period. So the annealing must be done at 60 minutes for one hour. But for the sake of this lab, we are going to do it at different time interval. We are going to do it for 15 minutes. We're going to keep our specimen in the furnace for 15 minutes and then remove it and cool it in air temperature. Then for 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, and 120 minutes to see how the effect is changing. So this is the standard. We have to keep it for 60 minutes, but we are going to do it at different time to see what happens. And that's what this is the expectation for our stress strain curve. So we can see the the trend is the opposite of the cold working. The higher here we keep our specimen in the furnace, the more ductile our material is, the lower yield, the lower ultimate. And if we have it as low as 15 minutes, you can see we still have some effect of cold working. So we have not been able to remove the effect of uh, cold working from our uh, material. So what macroscopic properties we observe is basically the opposite of cold working. We have lower yield and lower ultimate. So you can think of it as a disadvantage of annealing. And the, the advantage is higher ductility. And we measure ductility by looking at the elongation. And what macroscopic changes are causing such macroscopic behavior, we are releasing the residual stresses. The grain boundaries are rearranged, are no longer deformed, and we are reducing the dislocation density.